All right. So uh, I'm assuming we're pretty much done with uh, the LDA for 5B. Right. So let's let's do a quick recap. LDA. That's our main topic. The last um, uh, we do reverse generative model, uh, which is uh, documents into topics into words. Each topic is a probability over words. Each document is a probability over topic. The pseudo code have these A matrices, which is N by K. These are docs, topics. And B, which is topics by words. Um, the A and B are part of the pseudo code. We've been talking about them for three for three times. I'm not going to do that again. This is not a product, so we are not doing anything product here. We're having a probabilistic model, and that's been explained over and over in the past uh, three weeks. So what the principle of this is that the reverse generative model is to uh, for r equal one to a thousand. These are the rounds or iterations for d equal 1 to n, those are the documents, for positions, I think those are i equal 1 to d length, those are the positions in docs. So there's three, four loops here. Uh, resample topic ZID, which is the which topic is associated with document I, topic ID for doc D position I. That would be position I means uh, it's the word W uh, D I, right? The whatever word is in there. Reverse stands for we're not generating anything here. We have the documents, we have the words. So we only need to figure out what's the proper probabilities over topics, effectively who's ZID. But ZID is not, uh, we're not, we're not gonna end up with a deterministic value, topic number five. There's no way to know for sure what's topic number five in there. What we're trying to estimate here is a proper probability over the topic. So what we are updating in the end is for topic number five, what is the probability over the words? And for document D, what is the probability over the topic? So we keep updating those rows that are probabilities, distributions. In the end, it's not like the last ZID will be the correct ZID. In the end, we updating the probabilities, okay? So we have to do a little bit of uh, setup on A and B, and then update A and B. Right, so there's a there's a kitchen of things that happens in there, uh, and we we starting with A and B being some priors that we've discussed before alpha and beta. Now there's a lot of interesting things to know here. Those things that we've been doing in our past three lectures. One is this idea of multinomial distribution. Where is that coming from? That's coming from our assumption of how the generative process works. Remember, we say every document is a distribution over topics. So how the generative process works? Every document is a die. When I'm manufacturing a die, I'm getting probability over the faces of the die. Those would be the topics. Now, if I want to generate a document, I roll that die, IID, for every word. So if you have 100 words, I roll the die 100 times. Every time I roll that die, the die is fixed now that I have it. I obtain a topic. So it'll be topic for the first word, topic for the second word, topic for the last word, up to topic for 100 words. Now every topic, depending on what topic I got, I look into this and I, I, I get from that distribution, I sample a particular word. So there are multiple IID levels here. One is I fix the document distribution over topics. That's I get a die in my... my, my my hand with K faces. 
I roll the die IID for every word, and for every topic, I then pick a word from the distribution of that topic. That's the generative process. And what we show early, early on is that this process results in a multinomial distribution. The kind of Bernoulli kind of trials repeated for 200 times with so many faces and so many probabilities. So the first thing when you talk about generative models is the nature of the model, the actual step-by-step -step procedure, how things happen, results in a certain distribution. That's the multinomial. Related to it is the prior that we use. We use the prior that's very convenient mathematically, the Dirichlet function, aka beta function for k equal 2. That is the conjugate prior for multinomial. That makes the math work, meaning if you have that prior, when you update with the roles, you end up staying in the same family with updated counts. Often that happens in Bayesian inference. We choose the prior that works the math given the evidence distribution. So if the evidence will be Poisson, we'll have a conjugate prior for the Poisson distribution and so on and so forth. So typically, the way the generative process works results in that, that evidence distribution, which in our case is multinomial. But it doesn't have to be multinomial. In other cases, in other generations, in other processes, it may be Gaussian. Right? And then we choose the prior to be the, the nice prior that works the math with that. Of course, those models are not realistic. You can easily argue uh, nobody will generate a document by rolling dice and picking words from a topic and nothing like that. The English language or any language doesn't work that, like that. Nevertheless, that's our assumption for how documents are generated. And then when we invert it, we are asking what are the right parameters, those topic distributions and document distributions, that are likely or have the best chance to have generated my data set, 20 news groups. Of course, that chance is extremely small. No, no way you pick any A and B distributions and start rolling dice and you obtain the 20 news groups uh, document. That's absolutely impossible, right? But it's a theoretical model. When we calculate probabilities and we say the best probabilities are the one that has the highest theoretical chance to produce that outcome. So that's our plan. We discussed the pseudocode of this. The tricky part is to resample this. This resampling happened from uh, the, that this, this distribution, the Gibbs distribution, conditional, which is probability of that ZI given all other topics and params. So because we're doing this in a round robin iteratively, we have to compute at each step this distribution. That's the only key part in the whole algorithm. So in the whole algorithm, the pseudocode, I'm going to put it up one more time. It's how you compute this conditional distribution. Now, following the math, just putting into pseudocode is not that hard. I give you the formula. <coughs> and that is our baby <coughs> right there. So in order to finish this whole thing, we need to talk about sampling. And in your homework 5B, you have at least two or three sampling exercises. Now, sampling is much more general as a process than just LDA. So it's useful for you to have a sense of how is it that I sample things, whether it's for LDA or for other things. So sampling, what I mean by sampling is not computing the distribution. That's a very Gibbs-specific thing that has to do with the multinomial, with these Dirichlet distributions, how you compute that. So the math in all those problems will be related to the actual models that you have. If you use a Gaussian model, you won't have that math, you'll have a different math. But once you have the distribution, that's it, I have it, it's in my hand, I've computed it. How do I pick a topic from that distribution? or three topics, or whatever I need. So in different problems, I need to do different things. Um, so what we've been talking about is uh, inverse, so-called inverse CDF sampling. Maybe I'll redo that a little bit in here. Uh, and then, um, let's see. I use something here. <clears throat> we 
have something called reject sampling. Or sometimes reject accept may be called. Now, those both of them are very easy and intuitive techniques, and you should know them. I think most of you will know the inverse uh, sampling just by common sense. If I ask you to sample something from a distribution, we did this already. So this is saying, uh, here's my, my CDF. It has to go up because CDF being cumulative, it always adds probabilities, right? So this is the, the space of the outcomes and this is the cumulative distribution or density. If it's a continuous, it will be an integral. If it's a discrete, it will be like a stair. We pick a R equal random uniform 0, 1. So R is right here. And we invert the CDF. So if this is the, this right here will be CDF, I'm going to call it CDF at minus 1 of R, because at minus 1 means the inverse function. And whatever that comes, that will be the outcome I need. So if I have a die with non-uniform probabilities, I pick a random value, and I say where that hits the CDF of that die, whatever face is there, that's the face that I'm going to sample. Pretty easy, I think. Common intuition. Most people will come up with it without, without being, you know, lectured about. It. Um, so we have two options here. So x equals CDF minus 1 of r. Now there's two options, uh, procedurally speaking. Either invert CDF on paper. If the inverse CDF is a function that is computable, and I know it's something like an inverse of a function that I can calculate on paper, I can compute that directly. Let's, take, let's say that's a constant time kind of calculation assuming some exponentials and multiplications are easy to do. Or, so that's option one. Option two, do binary search. Uh, because this is monotonically increasing, I pick some initial value. I compute the CDF of that versus R. If it's bigger, I move to the right side. If it's smaller, I move to the left side. I cut it in half. I can do that on a, on a monotonically increased function or array because I can move up and down, cut in half. So that would be this, let's say this is constant time. This would be kind of log n. Well, n is granularity. It depends how, how tight you want to be there. Um, so that's that. Now, I should point out here that a lot of the interesting sampling that you need to study is for non-uniform distributions. Right? If, you, if you're looking at something where stuff is uniform, meaning everybody has the same probability, sampling is not a problem, right? Are we agreeing with that? If I pick students or patients or topics or whatever, and doesn't matter what process it is, uh, I mean LDA could be some other thing, if I end up sampling from a uniform distribution, meaning all my outcomes have the same probability. How do I do that? Programmatically. Do I need to do any of this stuff? How do I do it? Say I have a class of 50 students and I want to make a basketball team of five or a soccer team of 10. Are you guys watching soccer at all? United States playing right now a game with Iran has no soccer uh, you know, value at all, zero. Both teams are useless. But it may have a political value, you know. These guys might get bombed soon by United States and some allies. I, I don't know anything about wars, but somebody, you know, people said it might get get into bombing. So uh, I guess uh, people will look at this soccer game and say, "Hey, uh, what's up with that?" Uh, I guess it's playing right now. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. So are you watching soccer? Hello, anybody? Yeah. Good. Uh, I, I don't, but I have a roommate at home, somebody who lives with us, which is crazy about soccer, but only about European and South American teams, I think. Uh, anyway, so back to my sampling problem. I have a class of 50. I want to make a soccer team of 10. Everybody has equal probability. How do I do it? How do you write the program to pick 10 people at random? At random meaning everyone has the same chance. 
We don't even, that chance will be, co it's computable, right? If it's 10 out of 50, the chance of everybody might be one over five to be picked. But we don't care about what that chance is. We want to be equal. How would you pick 10 people out of 50 at random? Hmm. This is a very standard undergraduate exercise, not necessarily related to statistics. You know, we can formulate this exercise in the math, discrete math course, without mentioning the word statistics or probability. I want 10 people picked out of a class of 50 at random, such that if I repeat this process every day for a million days, the number of times everybody gets selected to play, it's roughly the same. Right? How do you do it? Yes. Oh, anybody has a plan? If, there's no right, right or wrong answer here. You have a plan? If if somebody hits you with that question, you know how do you do it? Generate a number between one and fifty. Uh huh. And then generate uh, by calling the random generator of the computer. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then add that person to your team if they're not already in the team. And then keep going. Then keep Eliminate going. that person. Because this is called without replacement. Without replacement is I can't select the same person twice. Usually when I roll a die or a coin, it's with replacement. I'm assuming if I roll a die 100 times, I could allow the, any face to come up more than once, right? But when you select a team of 10 out of 50, you don't want the same person more than once in your team, right? You can't. So I select a number, I pick that. I think that's equivalent to actually select a permutation at random, permute all the people, and then pick the first 10. Isn't that random? Right. So that's the standard procedure. Call some random permutation function. That's, it's called, some languages call it shuffling, shuffle. Now you should know, theoretically, no computer random uniform, it's perfectly random uniform. That's impossible. So that's why you call pseudo random generator because you cannot do it perfectly uniform. Uh, they have some systems that they, they calling in convergence, so it's quantum computing, uh, more close to uniform, but the standard x86 architecture cannot generate perfectly uniform numbers. But pseudo random is pretty uniform for, for any practical purpose. So I generate a permutation, and I top, I pick the first k. In my case, 10 out of 50, uh, I pick them to play soccer. And if I knew it again the same day, I'll shuffle again the whole class, pick the top. Right? So non-uniform uh, uh, sampling is not a big deal. In most cases, uniform sampling, I don't actually have to compute probabilities. It comes down to shuffling and ranking and pick something at random from that ranking. So it's not so much a matter of computing distributions because it's uniform, so everybody has the same chance. Also, it allows sampling uh, to be computed without repetition, which is a big deal. Sampling that uh, allows repetitions, meaning I roll the die, I've got a five, and then I roll the die again, I can get five again, that's with replacement or with repetition. It's not that difficult. Sampling without replacement could be very difficult. So let me make a, a little table here. Let's say we want to sample k items out of n. Uh, I'm going to say roughly with probabilities p1, p2, pn. This is incorrect, what I'm writing on the board right now but I want to create kind of a, a general conditions, general setup of where we are. And we can say, uh, we have several dimensions, right? Uh, let's say um, P is uniform versus P is not uniform. And then I have, uh, I allow with replacement, that is the same item can be picked more than once, uh, without replacement, 
that these items cannot be poked with more than once. I should have another dimension, that is the z-axis here, it's coming out of the board, which is k equal 1 or k bigger than 1. You sample one thing, or are you sampling 10, 15 things? Of course, this is not relevant if k is equal 1. If k is equal 1, I only sample one thing, there's no such thing as replacement. I'm done, right? So what's easy here? What I just described is the uniform distribution. And we say, this is simply shuffling, right? Pick first. OK. Let's call it easy, right? What if I do with replacement? Uh, this is easy because I'm going to do it this one, which is, which is you can apply the same algorithm. If it works for a particular P that's not uniform, the same process will, will also work for P. How would you do with replacement uh, from a non uniform distribution? That I think is the die case, right? If I have a fake die that has non uniform properties, say has more six and fives and fours, higher numbers, and lower one, two, and threes. So this die is not going to produce uniform outcomes. How do I pick with replacement k things? I roll the die k times. This is essentially, because it's with replacement, it's looping k equal 1 k times. So it's just repeating whatever process you have for 1 k times. So this is repeat k equal 1 uh, k times. So how do I do that? I use something like e inverse or reject sampling uh, and then I repeat k times. So I can use a method like this to roll the die once and then I get an outcome and then I, I roll the die the same and the same and the same. So we're going to talk about a different one that effectively does what this one does, just more efficient. Now, of course, I can I can repeat that process. Um, uh, I, I can do the process for uniform, that process. But for uniform, I can just do this instead. And this one here is hard or impossible sometimes. So this would be a nice interview question for people who did not study sampling. That will immediately try out, like separate the people who can think in terms of sampling and the outcomes and the ones who can. I have a distribution of 100 things that's not uniform. So I have, my distribution correlates to ability to play soccer. People who I know they play soccer well have a high probability to get selected in the team. People who don't play soccer well have a low probability. Right? So I match my probability something to do with their soccer ability. Say so maybe the probability is related to how many goals they scored in the past. The more goals they score or the more you know, defensive plays they make, the more I increase their probability to be selected. And the ones who don't play that well have a decreased probability, but never zero. So I don't want to run 100% or zero probabilities. Because in sampling, we don't, we don't do that. We can have 100% stuff. Right. So I have a non uniform probability over 100 people. I have to select 10 of them according to those probabilities without replacement. So it's not like selecting one and then repeat the process, because if I do that, I may get the same person twice. We can prove that most likely there is no algorithm who can in the end satisfy those pro the initial probabilities that you have. In fact, you can think of the extreme. What happens when k gets close to n? If I have 100 people with different probabilities and k become close to 100, I say the chance of being selected become close to 100%. If you have to pick 99 out of 100, you cannot respect the probabilities that are given because you're going to be forced to effectively pick almost everyone. Even the ones with low probabilities, they will be picked because there's no replacement, right? 
So when k gets larger and larger and larger, the effective sampling probability, so that's a very important concept in, in all the sampling books, effective or posterior sampling probability, let's call it QI, is the probability that I is in the sample. So that is not related to the procedure necessarily, is what's the chance that the person gets picked. My point here is that when K gets close to N, QI gets close to 1. So in the, for example, in the without replacement K out of N, with a non-uniform, even with a non-uniform P. P is the given sampling distribution. Q is the posterior case, what, what I actually result in. Uh, when the limit of K, when K goes to N, it's close to N, the limit of QI will be one. As, as, as K moves closer and closer to N, everybody will be selected, right? So this in here is something that uh, requires some thinking. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you something very basic about that. But that's only when k is not 1, because if it's 1, I just pick something from with inversion sampling or rejection sampling. And when the probability is not uniform, because if it's uniform, I shuffle them and I pick k of them. So these kind of things can happen a lot in processes like LDA. Every once in a while you have to sample a document, sample a topic, sample, sample, sample. That means, of course, the difficulty is in the math. How do you compute the distribution? And you're going to have that not just in the LDA. In these other problems, you have a part where you have to figure out the distribution. We're not, we're not emphasizing the math, so most of this stuff for the homework, you don't have to derive the math. They, we give you a formula and you can just implement that formula, including for LDA. But then you have a distribution. This very likely is going to be non-uniform. Chances are that these conditionals are not going to come out uniform, right? So you have to pick a, a topic out of that distribution. So you're going to use some of these techniques in here. So, invert, so we, we're going to talk about four things. Inversion sampling, rejection sampling, I don't know if we did that before, but uh, we want to sample one item from distribution P. Uh, I think the note is F, but that's fine. Uh, one. And instead, we know, or we do, sample from distribution Q. Say so we don't know how to sample from P, but we know how to sample from Q, right? That, that's the idea here. And then um, uh, we want Q close to P. But again, if we could sample from P directly, we would do that. So it's, it's a kind of a trade-off. The closer Q is to P, the more we don't know how to sample from it. So we want a distribution. Um, we could use Q equal uniform, because that one we know for sure how to sample. So what do we have here? We have P, P is a PDF not a CDF. So P, we have P that we don't know how to sample from. And we have Q that we know how to sample from, say, right? And then we sample uh, an X here. So we say the first say, sample X from Q, we write that X uh, sample from Q of X like that. This sign sometimes sample from that is selected from that distribution. And then 
uh, we look at where x is, right? and then we we sample r uniform uh, between zero and some max. Max is kind of the maximum we need. And then we look at if r um, is smaller than, uh, what is it? P of x by Q of x, I think. Uh, or equal, accept x, else reject x. So this has to be uh, part of the one, one iteration. There's some math in there. So I, I think the easiest way to understand, we're not going to go over the theory, but there is, there is intuition if think about uh, what happens if Q is uniform. Uh, this method becomes sample X uniform sample R uniform, and then uh, if R is smaller than F of X, accept, uh, I guess this is times a max here, else reject. So that intuitively, it's very clear right, what happens. For any x, this is the p of x right here. And uh, any of the random r that falls into this part of the bar indicates acceptance, because that's kind of like how big p of x is. Any r that's above p of x means rejection. So what's going to happen for p of x very high, is it's going to be accepted a lot of times, because my random r is going to feel below p of x. And for p of x very lows, a lot of things will get rejected. Now, this is perfectly fine, but Q uniform is not necessarily the best thing because you want a Q that's reasonably close to P, some sort of approximation of P. For example, if you know your distribution is what's called a typical standard distribution, typical standard distributions are the ones that have a lot of probability close to the mean. So there is a mean, every distribution has a mean. Everything that's relatively close to the mean, it's called typical, meaning most students are like that. Most cars are like that. Most diseases are like that. Most laptops are like that. Close to the mean. Now, not all these distributions are necessarily Gaussian, but most of them can be approximated with the Gaussian distribution. So if I know I have a typical distribution with most value close to the mean, those are the most natural distributions. If you look in nature, most animals have a certain behavior, right? The farther you go from the mean, the, the, the frequency drops typically exponentially, right? So even though my distribution P, it's, I think it's typical, but I don't know, it, it may not be Gaussian, it may be some other, other thing close, maybe skewed one side, for example. I can use Q a Gaussian sample from there because Q would be a decent approximation for P and then use this thing to correct my results effectively. There might be some that are rejected more than would be otherwise from a Gaussian directly. If P is not a Gaussian, I get more rejections, but that's okay. So you don't want to use in here a Q that's uniform if you can have a better guess on what Q by P is. This process in a lot of fields, this, this fraction P by Q has many names in many fields. Many people have find this intuition that every time I need to sample from a distribution, but I sample from an approximation, somehow I need to correct my sample, my outcome. This is accepting or rejecting the sample, which may be a patient or maybe a, a car or some item. But if X is a numerical value in other domains, 
sometimes we modify the x. So we say we sample a value, a number, a quantity. And then we multiply with p of x by q of x that quantity to kind of uh, to modify it according to distribution. So be because it's sampled from q instead of p, I think some, some names of this process might be important sampling or scaling sampling, where I sample from a distant distribution, but then I, I post sampling, I, I affect the outcomes to correct for the ratio between the distributions. So this phenomena has been found in a lot of uh, physics, biology, all kinds of fields, and they call it different things. Where I sample from a distribution, but then I correct the outcome proportional with the ratio between the distribution I want and the distribution I actually used, typically an approximation of P. So that's a good idea to know. If I get stuck with sampling something from a weird distribution that I don't know, but somehow I can estimate or calculate the P of X, I can approximate it with some other distribution that is close enough to it. The better, the closer, the better. And then sample from there and correct the outcomes, and there's a bunch of theorems that determine how well I'm going to do. What's an example of a distribution that you can't sample from directly? Directly meaning what? Like, like what's an example of, of a P of X that's, that's challenging? Like um, we would need to approximate it. I'm trying to think, like, in the context of, of word counts, like, we can just use the word frequency. Right, so right? you can do, if you know how to calculate P, you yeah. know how to calculate so the CDF when, of P. When can't we, count, like, what's a real world example of when we couldn't calculate P, P of X? Um, so I think a lot of a lot of distributions that I'm aware of are based on uh, something to do, like in ELO scores, for example, when they compute scores outcomes based on matches. So uh, we talked about this issue a little bit when we say convert scores into distributions. In a lot of problems, I have some sort of metric evaluating. ELO is used in chess, I believe, but but I, you know you can have other scores. Say in information retrieval, you have evaluation of results based on some, some uh, NDCG or some other matrix in there. And how do you associate probability based on the ranking? There's a formula transformation. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I think where this is coming from is that you have many items for which you don't know the exact ranking. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things might be equal to each other. A lot of things might be grouped into the first 10, the next 100, and the next 1,000. So in that next 100, we don't know which one is exactly number 17. Um, but your question, I think, is more procedural. If I know P, I can compute a CDF and do this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this is not an efficient way of doing it. It computationally can take longer than this. In fact, I think the notes I have claim that this is much faster. If you have a decent Q, that is. Mm -hmm. So this depends on how, how close Q is to it. Uh, I think we can look at some examples. Uh, and again, I think the, the, challenging, the, the, the challenging situations that you might get in them might be related to uh, if you sample one thing or many from non-uniform distribution. So this is still effectively a process that's with replacement because what I'm going to do, if, if you say, okay, sample not one, but three things, I'm probably going to repeat this process three times. The problem with repeating the process three times, it's definitely into the with replacement realm, because I can get the same outcome again. I, I'm showing you those things because they form the basics of sampling in general. So if you, if you want a technique, in fact, my code that I wrote for undergraduate class, I'm going to run it for you. The basic sampling, I think, implements inversion sampling, no, no matter what you actually sample and how many times. Um, if I want to do without replacement, a naive way of thinking about that is to sample an item and update the distribution, right? So think about this. I sample one item, and then whatever outcome comes, I'm eliminating them. I'm saying that's not possible anymore. So now updating the distribution means I have to keep the other PIs and maybe rescale them to sum to one. 
um, that rescaling right away will gonna cause the piece to change. So once you keep doing that enough times, the piece are not gonna look like the, the previous piece, right? Um, what if, um, what if I, What if I want to sample, say, if I know it? So um, I, I want to distinguish another, another uh, situation here. I'm putting it in a main table here. Do we want exact K items with approximate Q? P, or we want exact p probabilities with approximate how many items. So that's another interesting thing to think about, kind of the main table. I'm going to show you a very simple way to sample my 10 soccer players from the uh, room of 100, and that everyone will have exactly the p probabilities that he started with. How do I do that? I go to the first player, I say, what's your probability to be in the team? 60%. I flip a coin with 60% chance. If he comes head, he's in. If he comes tail, he's out. I go to the next player, what's your probability to be in the team? 85%. I change my coin to 85%. I flip it. If he comes head, you're in the team. If he comes head, tails, you're not. Now, at the end of this process, can we agree that everybody selected got exactly the probability P to be selected that we started with, because it's an IID process. So if your chance was, so it, it, I can guarantee that in this sense, P will be exactly Q. The probability of V selected, the posterior probability, will be exactly the probability that I'm given. What's the problem with that process? You're only around K players. Maybe not even K. Yeah. Let's. I uh, can I can I, if I do that, I if have to go through nobody. everybody. First of all, can I stop at some point? Not if you want to keep the P's honest. Once I got ten players, I have to keep going, right? I mean, it's possible that I got ten players before asking everybody, flipping the coin for everybody. Yet, in order to satisfy those P's, I have to go through every single player. So the problem with that is I'm not gonna end up with ten. I'm gonna end up to, actually, how much? Zero to n. We we can estimate, right? The expected number of sample will be what? If I go through every p and I ask, I flip the coin. So I have a bunch of numbers: p1, p2, p3. Those are probabilities. I go to every one of them. I say, with that chance, you un. With the other chance, you out. What would be the expected number of things in there? mean of all the probabilities times n? I think it will be the sum of the PIs. Yeah. Because the, the PIs don't sum to 1. P is not a distribution. Everybody has a probability to be selected. If P is a distribution, the expected is 1. Yeah. Right? So in other words, if my die has a property over the faces, Right, and uh, I I run over each face, and I roll that probability. In the end, I'm gonna select one on expectation value. If if for everyone I say yes or no with that probability. But if those probabilities are not summing to one, my expectation, it's not gonna be uh, one. It's gonna be whatever the sum of the probabilities is. Now, can I fix that? So continuing these ideas, uh, we can say we want here the sum of the PIs to sum to K. So at least in expectation, I'll get roughly 10 players. So how would I do that? Maybe scale them to do each PI is uh, effectively the PI divided by the sum of the PI multiplied by K, something like that. That way, the sum of pi sum to k. If I go to every single one, ask a question, 
on experts I get K. That's not exactly right, because some of the PIs now may be bigger than one. Is it possible to do PI divided by sum of PI times K get better than one? I think that's possible. So I can run into trouble with that. I don't know how to sample something with chance bigger than one. I can threshold it at one, but then I, again, I'm not satisfying the exact PIs. So there are some ways to go around. I don't want to go into all those statistical you know, ways. My point in here, the main point is if you're willing to sacrifice the exact K, you might be better, you might be, uh, there might be a way to get much closer to the PI probabilities that you have by doing independently. Again, the problem being in the end, you're not gonna have K. So this is a particular problem where K is strict. Like in soccer, you can, you can show up and say, I play with 12 people because that's how my sampling went. That's not gonna fly, right? It has to be 10. But in some cases, that's pretty acceptable. Like if I'm the government and I do, I don't know, student loans. I wanna do an average of 100,000 student loans. I can tweak my methods to be the expectation 100,000. And then if I end up with 104,000 or 98.6 thousand, I think that's okay. It's roughly what I want it to be, right? So in some processes, I'm, I'm being less rigorous now and more practical. If you really need to hit a target and you care more about exact probabilities, some boss or hospital or, or constraint comes to you, you really have to follow these probabilities. Typically, this is a legal requirement in some processes. Uh, things like uh, you have to be done that way because the process needs to be certified. And if you don't hit the probabilities, it's not certified. But the total outcome is loose. You don't need exactly 10 players you may be better off going IID uh, through, this, through this data. So that is a way maybe to solve this by sacrificing K by getting exact piece. What if you sampled again and again until you got exactly K? Is that still satisfying everything? Again and again, meaning? So let's, let's say you, you did the thing where you like 80% change your coin, flip it for everyone. And then you just keep doing that until you get the exact K that you want. Because, you know, like sometimes you'll, you'll have two less than K. So I go to the first player, I flip the coin, yeah. second player. This coin are not the same coin. It has to follow yeah. the probability of the players. The problem is the order matters. The ones at the end have a very low probability to be selected. So, but you do that process with everybody until, and then until you, and just repeat it until you get exactly the K that you want. Nope, so what if I get the K before reaching the last person? Then you, you always do it with everybody. Okay, but then I get more than K. Or, or less than K, right? Or less, but what if I get more? Then, then do it again, start over. I give up and just give try up. until yeah. I get K. I don't know the answer to that question. Sounds interesting. <laughs> People have thought about this problem for a long time. In fact, there is a guy who wrote a book with 60 methods, the best 60 methods known to approximate this issue here. Best, uh, I don't know how many, 50 or 60 practical approximations of this problem. Mm -hmm. This might be one of them, but I don't remember it. I'll show you one that is, I, I, we, we needed this for some, for some problems for real, and we studied that book with some PhD students, and I'll show you one that I think is the best compromise between the theory and practice. Something that if you really need to do this, well, what you gonna do? You can study statistics for five years, but if you really need to get it done in say in a week, what is a decent method to get exactly K, but approximate those PIs decently? You should know that's impossible to hit the PIs exact unless you sacrifice the K. If you're willing to go a little further or less, you know. So often you, you as data scientists, gonna be put into much more challenging practical situations than theoretical situations. Uh, in my experience so far, I'm not an old teacher like you can say, I've been teaching for about 15, 18 years or so. Uh, my experience with students that went and get uh, machine learning and data-based jobs, visualizations, uh, analytics, uh, anomalies, things like that. 
most of people who got back to me got back to me with questions that are far more practical than theoretical. Very rarely people came with a math problem that they say, I really need to solve it and I don't know how. Much more likely they get into a practical situation. Like I really needed to sample some patients and my boss gave me some probabilities and what do I do now? Because like I need to get something. So that will be the moment to tell your boss, do you really want a hundred? I know you said a hundred, but would you be fine with like 90 something or a hundred and a few? Because sometimes this batch is being analyzed by some people, maybe doctors look at them, maybe they do a study. And if they want a hundred, but they get a hundred and three, it's not like gonna change the main thing of the study, right? When you do a survey, you, you could be fine with a little bit more or less. So if your boss said, yeah, yeah, it's okay. We want around a hundred, but more or less it's fine. Then to hit those properties exact, maybe an ID sampling is the way to go. If the boss says, no, 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 we absolutely must have a hundred. Uh, well then, I'm gonna show you a practical method to do this. So um, let's do that. That I think is in your homework. That, I'm gonna write it here. Steven's method for sampling k out of n with probability p1, p2, with approximate p2, pn um, without replacement. Yeah, with replacement, it's easy. I just sample one and then repeat that process k times. If it's like die faces that I can allow the same face to come up or coin flips, uh, that's okay. But without replacement means selecting people or patients or cars, I can't select the same patient twice. All right, so there are four steps here. Step one, sort PI's uh, descent and uh, make Actually, let's just sort PI descent. So imagine I have uh, PIs sorted So sort items. These are the, the PIs from 1 to N. This is the PI. It doesn't have to be a straight line. I mean, this could be a more like but it's it's going down to make groups in order of k each. Um, and then also uniform probability inside each group. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to transform this distribution into the first k, 1 to k, and in here I'm going to take those items and I'm going to make them uniform. So the probability here will be the sum from i equal 1 to k of the actual pi divided by k. So I take the first k probabilities, I make the sum divided by k, so that's my group. So what I do here, I sort the piece and now I make groups of k. Now the next group will be from k plus 1 to 2k, right? But Obviously, the average will be smaller because all those probabilities from k to 2k are smaller. On average, they will be a smaller value, right? Then the next group is from 2k plus 1 to 3k, and then that's going to be even smaller. So I effectively change the probabilities here where those groups, they go to uh, up to roughly n by k, 
groups times k, right? And maybe it's a stair if, with a constant, because everybody's k, 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 k. I have roughly n by k groups. I'm assuming here uh, n is reasonably larger than k, something like 100 versus 10. Because if k is close to n, again, I'm going to be forced to pick most of these items anyway. right? If k is 90 out of 100, the probability is I may be sorting by piece and just pick the top 90 out of that. So are you guys following me? First, I sorted the probabilities. Second, I grouped them in groups of, of k. But inside each group, I summed the probabilities, divide by k. Everybody in the group got the same probability. So there's no distinction between this and this item. Even though initially they have different properties, now they have the same probability. But there is a difference between groups. Step number three, sample groups with the group probability is the whole chunk, is the total group, total group uh, probability. Sample groups um, with replacement K times. So I'm not sampling individual items. I'm looking at the groups with the probability, the sum of all the items here, which is K times the average. This property, they still, this, um, I may have to normalize that, but in principle, the fact that it's with replacement allows me to sample one of the groups, right? And then repeat that process K times. Because with replacement means if I pick this group the first time, I can pick the same group again. So if I look again at that distribution, I may have uh, the outcomes. T is the out, outcome count. So maybe I got this group seven times, this group four times, this group two times, this group zero times, this group two times, this group one time, and this group zero time, right? So this is the actual outcome. When you sample with replacement, how many times I selected that group, how many times that group. Now, if these numbers, the sum of ti's here have to sum to what? How many times I've got that, 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 that? What that sum going to be? K. K, because I sample it k times. So each time, one of the groups got selected. And the magic is in number four. Inside each group, sample ti, inside each group i, sample ti items uniformly without replacement. So in other words, if if this guy got seven times selected, pick seven items from this group without replacement. So H1 is selected at most ones, but uniformly, which we know how to do, right? Remember? Uniformly, we just shuffle, pick the first how many? That's it. easy to say when somebody shows it to you, very hard to come up with this kind of thing. In fact, people have studied this for a very long time, up to when someone said, okay, you want something that works actually in practice? It's, it's, it's giving you some approximation of the properties that you started with the piece. And it does obtain exactly key items, is that true? Because the sum of these t's are gonna be exactly k, and is there ever a chance that I cannot do this? So like this guy is a seven. Is there ever a chance that I say, you cannot pick seven at random from here? What's the maximum that a group can get in theory? K, but how many items are in a group? K, okay. so if, if 
theoretically speaking, one group gets selected k times. That may happen when the first k items have a huge probability and everybody else is pretty low. In practice, I can get the first group k times. That says you just pick all the k items in that group. Right? That's, that's the extreme, but it's still doable. Right? So the guy who wrote this book, Manif, I believe, uh, the book is old. It's written in before they had LaTeX. So it's written with a typing machine. Yeah. They have a listing of 50 or 60 procedures that you can do. And we <laughs> go the way, all the way to 1965 when the guy wrote the book, or 75. That's before LaTeX, so it's not LaTeX properly. Because we couldn't find a way to do this in practice. Uh, this was for the information retrieval survey type of thing when we needed to select people and, and uh, documents in the, in the retrieval evaluation to kind of say how satisfied are people with the results. So we needed a sample that satisfied some probabilities and we needed exactly a fixed K. But we, you know, that's how I spent probably three months studying that problem. And the difficulty was, I, I'm a math major so I can study math. It's just that uh, I, I was expecting something more recent than 1970 that, that can deal with this problem. So I'll show you a little bit of that. So this you have to program. In your homework 5B, there is an exercise that say program this. It's very easy to program. You get the PIs, sort them, make groups of K, sample this double sampling here. The first sample is with replacement K times the groups, which you do it once and repeat it K times because it's with replacement. You just need to keep count of how many times you got each group. And then for each group separately, independently, you go by the count and select shuffle the items, pick how many TI you need to pick of them. So I'm, I'm putting this method here, Stevens. Many mathematicians will disagree with me, will say, ah, that's an approximation, you need to prove things, there are better methods, fancier. Trust me, if you actually need to do this, like in a real situation with car or patients or students or something, you don't want to get yourself into a huge computation that you may have to explain to somebody intuitively. You want to get yourself into a common sense situation. What happens here if k is a lot smaller than n? I think we can easily show intuitively that the piece will be pretty close. Because if k is a lot smaller than n, we can argue in the same way integral Riemann discretization works that those groups will be a pretty good approximation of the actual probability, right? Of course, when the groups are large, everybody gets the same probability, that could be far away from, from, the, from the actual probabilities before uniformization. But if, say, k is 3 and n is 10,000, assuming I don't have big gaps in here, that will be the, the issue where this method fails. Suddenly, at k equal 562, there is a drop from whatever it was down to almost zero. So if that gap happens in the middle of a group, that can create a problem because some of the items who had almost a zero probabilities, now they have a decent probability. But assuming the P's are roughly uniform, if, if any 10,000 of soccer players, it's unlikely that it drops from something big to something small really quick. Right. Usually those probabilities, they, they look pretty smooth of a lot of items. So back to the example, n equal 10,000, k equal 3 or 5. Chances are that five consecutive things are pretty close to each other. They won't see a big dropping gap from item 562 to item 563. Assuming that's true means every probability after uniformization is pretty close to the probability before uniformization, right? Because this is the average of k things around there, but if k is small, it's pretty much that. Now, what is the cube? The probability that item i is actually selected posterior. So what is the chance that an item I is selected here? The chance that its, its group is selected divided by the number of things in that group. So what's the expected TI? 
we, we don't know the TI exact because TI is however comes out of that process, but we know the expectation, right? I think is the probability of the group times K. Uh, if the probability of a head is 65% and I flip the coin 20 times, the expected number of heads is 65% times 20. Right? This is a IID process, like all the, all the sampling is done independent of the previous one, and the, the probabilities don't change. With replacement, I have the same exact probability. So the expected TI is the probability, uh, the group probability, group probability I, that's the sum of all the items in that group, times K. Right? So now simple exercise that this, if K is, is small and, and uh, P is smooth, like we don't see those big drops, then QI is pretty close to PI. So we had huge success with this method. Also very defensible. A lot of the problems in data science today are not so much what you run, but rather how can you explain it to people which are not, I've said that before, people which are not data scientists, bankers, lawyers, judges, politicians, uh, a lot of economists that ask questions, uh, people who run their own business, you know, how did you do that? Why is it like this? Why is it like that? Uh, sometimes simple methods facilitate these explanations for people which are not technical. So you're going to have fun implementing this. Let me see if I can show you a few things here. Um, I really want to get 10 minutes to show you something new that I don't want to do it on Friday, but you know, you may have to do it on Friday if we don't do it now. So first thing first, I want to show you my undergraduate introduction to sampling code that's written in MATLAB. It's linked to this website and you can play with it. Uh, that's not necessary if you're familiar with sampling, but if you are not at all, like you've never seen sampling before of any kind, here's how you roll a die, okay? Or two dice or something. So here's my MATLAB. Uh, it has a nice interface. Uh, for undergraduate students. So what do we do here? I look into this code and I want to sample two, let's do one first, one die non-uniform. So you can see why it's saying three and four, because the probabilities on threes and four faces are much bigger than the rest. You can see this die has large probability on face three and four and pretty low probabilities outside those faces. So if I run this die, here's how you run the thing. You, you roll it in MATLAB, you say something like, uh, type the, the task here. With replace means I can obtain the same outcome more than once, it's necessary for dice and coins and stuff like that. And 10 is how many sample you want for every key press. So every time I press a button, rolls the die 10 times. I could set that to 20 or 50, and then what's gonna happen? Um, it shows me what the outcome of the roll is. That is, you got uh, two, uh, you got three, one, two, three threes, three fours, and three fives. That's out of 10. If I press this button, I think it's the green is the latest batch and the blue is overall scale, so you can see them, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to see the green counts versus the blues. The blues gets up and the greens will be pretty low. The greens always are the latest 10 and the blues it's overall. So what do you think is gonna happen? At the top there, it gives me something, sample size. So I roll that dice, uh, what, 1400 times or so, so far. The mean is 3.531, that's the empirical mean. It's not the theoretical mean, it's taking all the samples and average them. And I get the standard deviation there, that's the square root of variance that tells me how spread things are away from the mean. So standard deviation intuitive, intuitively, on average, how far it's a roll from the mean. 
Zero standard deviation means all the rolls are very close to the mean. High standard deviations, on average, how far away you are from the mean. So does that mean 3.5 makes sense? If the highest properties are three and four and they're equal, it does, right? And you can see empirically, three and fours are huge counts compared to the rest. What if I want to do two die roll uniform? How do I do that? So these are two dies that are uniform. Um, so each die is uniform, one six, one six, one six, one six with six faces. Uh, with replacement 10 times. But what you're gonna see as the outcome is the sum of the two dice. So when I roll the two dice, the outcome is actually, if I get a five and three, the outcome is an eight. So is the outcome uniform? If the dice are uniform, what are the possible outcomes? The minimum is? Two. Two, maximum is? Twelve. Are those uniform? No. So if I roll two, uniform dice. The chances of each face is the same. Is the outcome, which is the random variable of the sum of the two dice, uniform? No. no. The middle is much more likely. There's so many ways to get seven and eights, but pretty few ways to get twos and twelves. Twos and twelve is only one possibility, but seven or eight, there's a lot of them, right? So when I start rolling, rolling this, this die here, what am I going to get? It's getting closer to a typical distribution, but this is not Gaussian. Does the mean equal 7 make sense? 6.99? Is 7 the mean here? What's the mean of a die? Uniform die. 3.5? So is it, is it okay to say if I roll two dice, the, the average mean will be... 3.5 times 2, if I roll 4 dice, 3.5 times 4, right? It's the expectation rule that sums up the expectations anyway. And I get the standard deviation and mean and whatnot. Uh, let's do one more. Um, thousand car prices. Now, these are set up in a certain way, so thousand car prices. It's a normal distribution with the mean 14,000 and uh, I think this is the variance of 1,000 or standard deviation 1,000, I, I forgot. I, I think this is the variance. So this is so old that the average price of a car was $14,000. Yeah, that's not, that's not happening anymore. We have to change this to like 40,000, I don't know. And ne nevertheless, if I sample, I get uh, a bunch of cars in there. It's a Gaussian distribution because the it's sampling from a Gaussian distribution. So in this code, once you set up all these tasks, uh, if you run it, when it's actually sample, it's doing the inversion sample with binary search. You can see this is effectively a binary search formulation of I got my distribution, I pick an R, and I'm trying to find the actual X corresponding to that R, so I'm doing binary search in there. So I think this is, a piece of code that you can play with if you've never seen sampling, you can even modify some of these procedures to do other things. Uh, you get some meter grades, uh, average numbers, uh, uniform integers, coin tosses, the, the kind of thing that you would do in a stats class in an in a undergraduate, even advanced high school. Level. What else do we have here? We have the Gibbs problem from the homework. That is this problem. That is not the correct homework. I mean this homework. So the first problem asks you to do those three methods, inversion, rejection, and Steven methods, ABC. They're very easy to code. It's going to take you a little bit of time to play with them, but coding for this, it's easy. The second one, it says you got to do the Gibbs iteration sampling with two variables on a 2D joint. You can sample initially the whole joint to see it, but then we want to alternate via the conditional distributions. And this formula here, the link, takes you to the exact conditional distribution formulas, which are also Gaussian. You have to trust me on that. Or follow the derivation. So even though that looks a little scary, this whole thing, 
this is completely optional you don't need to follow this math here you can if you want to but what you really need is the final answer which is if I want the conditionals what is the mu and sigma and all you have to do is take this mu and sigma it's i j and j i or x given y and y given x and alternate and Gibbs sampling will guarantee that you obtain a sample that looks like coming from the joint. So if I'm to do that, what would I do it? Uh, I do, here's the P, I have two function X given Y, Y given X, Gibbs sampling which is gonna alternate between those two things, right? Y and X are here, here's the two functions. Those are implementing those formulas. So I'm, I'm not doing any derivation, I'm just implementing that. And I have some plotting things here. So if I do that, let me see. Um, this code is not written by me, it's written by a student. I don't know exactly how to make this code continue once it plots something, sorry. Uh, so this is the first thing, it's actually plotting the joint. So see, it's sampling from a joint. It's not doing the Gibbs. This red plot is not the Gibbs is because it's, it's right here, it's sampling the multivariate normal directly from that mu and sigma. And it plots what I've got, how many points are here, I don't know, 2,000 points, maybe? So that's sampling from that Gaussian distribution, okay? But once this uh, goes away, it does the Gibbs, which is sampling one by one from the conditionals. That's the Gibbs one. Be nice to keep that red one on the screen. I don't know how to do that. Uh, but the idea here is that if I sample enough, it's gonna look like the red one. So I expect you guys to get something like this going and maybe you can help me to keep the red plot on the screen if you can figure that out. Uh, we don't care Python versus MATLAB versus R, so whatever is convenient for you. And you can tell this is a very easy exercise in terms of what you actually need. The hard part is to figure out those derivations. What is the conditional distribution? That is a point I want you to remember. Oops. Where did we do that? The hard part in Gibbs is not the actual sampling, is computing the conditional. So where Gibbs has a chance to absolutely shine, when the conditional somehow are not hard to compute. That's exactly the part in LDA. These conditionals, you can see in the pseudo code, very easy to update and compute them. That has to do with the nature of Dirichlet, multinomial, and all of that. But it will be impossible to sample those topics from a joint distribution. That will be an our impossible thing to do. Yet the conditionals, once you have the other topics, are not too bad. So if you can compute the conditionals, Gibbs will give you, with some patience, it's not a very efficient method, it will take a lot of sampling, but in the end, it will give you the right answer. So there might be this situation where you face an almost impossible task in terms of scope and, and the, the joint distributions, yet if you give the conditionals, one given the rest, it will simplify the problem a lot. So that's this exercise for basic Gaussian functions. Um, the other stuff that I had here, uh, we don't have to run it again. I think I ran it before. This is my, I, or maybe I didn't run it, maybe I should run it. This is my code for the last problem, implement your LDA. We've already uh, talked about a lot of this stuff. Here's the pseudo code, the initialization. Uh, notice that even though the hard part in this whole LDA is understanding the multinomial directly, how it plays out, the only place where we, we need that, we're making 
uh, uh, we're making use of the fact that this counts get updated. So what happens with Dirichlet plus multinomial? If I start with the prior, say I'm giving every word count of three, and then I notice that word appearing six more times, I'm updating the count three plus six equal nine. So that's the basics that's needed here. So I'm starting with a bunch of counts with some alpha and beta right there. And then uh, a lot of this is pure logistics of the updates. The only time the A and B will hold unnormalized counting distribution. So this will be counts, counts. How many times a topic appears in that document? How many times a word appear in that topic? And if I need distributions, I have to normalize this thing. Now, the only time where it actually needs computation is where I have to compute the topic distribution here. So there is a formula that is the math. And the formula comes up to this. And dk are the values in A, dk. And nkw are the values in here, nkw. How many times you've seen that? Now, these are the, the evidence, how many times you actually seen that topic in that document. These are the priors. I don't keep separate the priors and that. For me, the whole thing is the value AA. It's the, what I started with, alphas, plus the counts I've seen. So you notice in my code, I only need this whole thing is, is, a, is an array because it's for each topic K. This is the array that's the A, the whole line. Uh, in MATLAB, D, comma, everything means use the row D and all the columns. So that row D and all the columns is exactly this array for all case. Because in my A, I start with alphas, and I update the values to the evidence. So I'm going to have this. The other stuff <coughs> is this one that is a dot product is cell by cell. This is also a K array, but you have to be careful to normalize. This is the B, B row right here. Because the same, B beta values are the ones I started with. This is the updated of what I've seen, whatever words are associated with our topics. And then each value has to be normalized properly before it's being multiplied with the corresponding cell. This is a cell by cell operation is not a dot product. It's like a dot product, but without the summation. So this is a K array, K array. Every value here is product with every value here. Except each value here has to be normalized by the sum. So before we do this multiplication, which is cell by cell, we're normalizing each value by cell with the B sum. Now, this is an array that looks like a column. So we have to transpose it to make the proper operation. But this whole math in here, if you represent A and B as matrices of counts, it comes down to this line. And that's the only thing that's technical. Everything else is just the kitchen operations. And you repeat it a bunch of times. Uh, I can run it to show you that it actually runs. Uh, that's the version that's MATLAB. So that is the actual, uh, not me. MATLAB is not doing GIP sampling internally. It's doing uh, EM. So it's faster, but it has more computation. Um, so if I run mine, uh, at every time, I think this is here the, the B matrix or the A matrix, I forgot. It finished how many iterations? I don't know. Oh no, it keeps doing it. I think every 50 iterations it replots the topics. So we have these topics here. Uh, that have been plotted, the, m the most important words in each topic, there are six topics, I believe, uh, that are being plotted every 50 iterations. So these are the, effectively the B, mat the B matrices for each topic. 
I'm plotting the highest probability words in a picture there. I think the orange ones are particularly high words. Um, and I think on the screen I get, on the, on the command line screen, I get the A matrices, which is how many documents I have. That's why you see six columns in there. In that, in that, uh, this is like for every document, what is the count over documents. So uh, this doesn't work very well. I mean, you can tweak it. If you see a, a column that's a dominant column, means a lot of documents are actually high on this topic, right? It means uh, if you want granularity, you would like to see different documents high on different topics. So again, if you see something with the big counts everywhere, it may mean that this is either something uh, soap words or something like this or associated with a topic that's very common in these documents. But ideally to separate those documents, we would like them to have different high values. So I mean, that happens occasionally. You see a document that has a 48 and 6 that is much more different than 1 versus 45, right? Uh, but yet I see that this is a relatively high column here compared to the rest, which means it's a dominant topic. This is not ideal. It's not what we want. We don't want to have a dominant topic. So you play with this. Um, last piece I want, not going to be able to do it here, um, is to show you We may do this a little bit on Friday. Um, is it this one? Yeah. I think I might have shown in this paper. We're going to do some part of it in class. So what we care, I, I think I showed this paper and I said the reason I like it so much is that the main example is exactly the LDA example. But what I'm interested in is this part a little bit of theory here, which looks at give sampling and say, here's an idea. We do it on a very basic example, a, a trivial high school level example, but the whole theory works on any distribution. Imagine if I have two variables and the joint distribution, so it's either one is uh, true or false, one or zero. So if I have two variables and I have four possibilities, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one, right? So if P1, P2, P3, P4 is the joint distribution. I can compute the conditionals, which I think you might have seen when you talk about the, con the le first lecture on conditional distributions is taking the joint and say, when x has a certain value, say when x is true, that's p1 plus p3. Out of the p1 plus p3, how many times y is true? That's just p1. So have you seen that where I have a discrete distribution right there, p1, p2, p3, p4? Let me actually do this really quick. What do we have here? Uh, p1, p2. P3, P4, this uh, is X, true, false, true is 1, false is 0, and this is Y, true, false. Right? What is probability of Y given true, given that X is true? How do I compute that from a joint table? Again, that's how you do in high school or in the college, the first time you do conditional property, you'd be like, okay, when is x true? x is true in here. That's x true. So out of that, p1 plus p3, when is y true? It's this one, p1. So that's how I get these probabilities. Very simple conditional in two by two case, that's the simplest joint possible. What these guys are doing here, which I'm going to show you next time, is saying if you alternate with Gibbs, you're going to pick y given x and then x given y, and y given x and x, x given y, right? So you look at the two matrices, 
you're going to pick alternatively from those two matrices with some changes in there, because we update given the samples we have. But then they're saying, I want to measure how much the sample of x changes from this peak of x to the next peak of x. And their idea is that by the next time you pick x, so this is the x given the previous x, you effectively running two conditionals. You're saying given the previous x, I pick a y, that's y given x. And then given this last y, I pick the next x, which is x given y. So it's kind of the x given y times the y given x. So the new x given x, it's going to be the product of these two matrices. We're going to do this process anyway as part of what we're going to call a Markov chain process. So I'm going to show you that next time. But the point is, once you have this a x given x, which is the x that depends on the previous x via the y that happened in between them, we can prove that in the end, this Gibbs process results in the correct egg distribution. So the proof happens right here, uh, but uh, they assume the Markov chain property, which we have to do. Markov chains are also extremely useful in practice. Markov chain refers to processes where the next sample or the next state or the next action, say in a game, say in a game like chess or like StarCraft, if you're familiar with Warcraft. It says, anything you do next does not depend on the history. It depends only on the position right now. So that's very typical for a lot of games. Chess, what you do next depends on the current position on the board. Doesn't matter how you got there. In StarCraft or Warcraft, your ability to win depends on the current situation in the game. Doesn't matter how you get there. That's not true, for example, for, I don't know, meaning of text. Text depends on history, not just the last sentence. But, but Markov chains are extremely useful to model what to be the next thing, given what I am right now, if I don't care about the history. So the, those kind of processes, which this is a particular case of a Markov process. That's why it results in the correct distribution. May be useful to model things really practically. Again, the canonical example is games that depend only on the current state. But that may be also have to do with, for example, I don't know how you get into an accident. If you do self-driving a car, what's the chance of getting an accident? It only depends on the state of right now, right? It doesn't depend, maybe, I mean, maybe it'll be a little history, the last five seconds, but that's typically incorporated in the current state. It doesn't matter how it went so far. Like if I'm to go on an accident because the car slips, slips on ice, it doesn't matter how I drive up to here. It just matters that I'm on ice right now. A lot of accidents, by the way, in sports, I'm familiar with that due to some consulting problem, happens without history. People, sickness and diseases depend on history very much. But accidents, like falling on stairs, breaking your knee, skiing, car accidents, do not depend on history. They typically depend on the current state of things. In other words, a computer can predict the accident very accurately given the current state. Like including incorporating things like, are you drunk or not? Are you tired or not? Are you sick or not? All of that thing can be incorporated in the current state. A stock market doesn't work like that. A lot of things that happen in the stock market depend on the history of things, not on the current situation only. Okay. So I think you guys have everything to do. Homework 5B, but of course we're going to talk about it more. Uh, what we do Friday for Markov Chains is not in the homework, so you have everything. Uh, we'll, I think we have office hours. Did we have office hours yesterday? Nobody showed up to office hours yesterday. Uh, you have to start the thing. I cannot emphasize this enough. There's no time left to be late for 5B and homework 6, because the term ends. And those are not like 5A. 5A is a easy easy piece of cake. These are not. I, I don't say they're hard. I think you've seen harder homework than this. 5B may be the hardest, but, but in general, you have to start them to not end up on Saturday the 17th. I cannot finish. All right. I'll see you Thursday at office hours or Friday in class. We still didn't finish this sampling thing.
Oh, one more thing. The videos are available on YouTube, but not on the website 